Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in Threat Report Roulette. We have some amazing guests today, and I'm going to go through the list really quick. Uh, we have Chris Russell, and he's the head of information security for T0 Group. We have Karan, and he's a CTI analyst for a big four consulting cybersecurity firm. We have Will Thomas with us, and he is a security researcher for SciJax. Uh, we have me, uh, Zena Olson, or Cheerio, and I am a senior cybersecurity analyst at a Fortune 500. And we have the stakeholders. We have the blind hacker. He's representing Red Team, and he's an InfoSec enthusiast and all around awesome dude. Uh, we have Danny D. Henderson, and he hails from being previously a CTI analyst, but moving more in DFIR. So he's going to re represent the DFIR slash CTI angle of Threat Report Roulette. We have Jorge, and he's the most awesome uh, unicorn joining us from Scythe. He represents red and purple. He's the CTO and the co-creator of the C2 Matrix, which I love, um, and also a ton of other stuff. And I'm a huge, I stan Jorge, like honestly I do. I can't help it, he's awesome. Um, and then finally, we have Ricky Banda, and he has a really fancy title. He's the Incident Commander for Amazon Security Incident Response Team. So all of these people are a big deal, super awesome, uh, seasoned professionals coming in to share their knowledge and wisdom for the threat reports that we have selected. And for the purposes of this talk, they are all TLP white. So we will not be discussing any TLP amber, anything or TLP red or TLP green. So, um, and also to the focus of this talk is and panel is more actionable takeaways, taking the information to the next level. And, um, you know, we wanted to bring Vegas to you in case you're not there in person. So threat report roulette. And as you can see on the screen, we have a threat report roulette wheel. And what we're going to do, we're going to spin the wheel. Uh, we'll call on an analyst and then they will give their insights for a couple of minutes. And then from there, uh, we will have our stakeholders. And the reason why we have stakeholders is because, well, they're the consumers of all of the info. And if they don't like it, that's bad. So we want to make things that they like and want to consume and are actionable within their org. And for the sake of debate and all of that, all of the reports we're going to assume are actionable and relevant to their organization as they're as the analysts are performing their analysis. All right. So is everyone ready to get started for threat report roulette? <laughs> Yep, we are yep. good to go. Yay, okay, so, and uh, audience, just, just be forewarned, I have a timer. And so I'm going to be timing the participants' responses, and uh, they have approximately five minutes to respond. So if they meet time, I'm gonna yell, time! So uh, don't, just be forewarned that I will be uh, very vocal in moving the session along. So. I am going to spin the wheel. Oh, what's it going to be? The defer report number two. So I'm going to the GitHub, going to look at the defer report number two. Oh, that's Soto no Kibi um, and Revol. And in case you guys want to play along in the audience, it is at bit.ly, or it's a bit.ly link, DC29 Roulette. DC 29 roulette, and that takes you to the GitHub page. So uh, let's see, D for report two, and that goes to Krooster. And you have 15 seconds to organize your thoughts, and I'm going to start the countdown right now. Sure, excellent. So um, right off the bat, uh, these DFI reports are very extensive. These are the type of things that multiple consumers in your org can use from the technical and strategic side. So among the reports we've gone through, I found these to be the most beneficial for the, the widest audience. But in this particular report, I went through and looked and saw some particular things that I would key on on for kind of creating some custom indica indicators, aside from just static hashes and IPs and domains that we all know change pretty, pretty rapidly. So for this one with Revol, uh, one of the things I noticed during the process is, is that they have Excel calling WMIC.exe. 
Um, now, if you're not familiar with that process, that's a kind of information kind of system gathering process. There's really no reason why an Excel document should ever be calling that in a normal environment. Uh, maybe you have a developer or a sysadmin that built their own custom tool, but in that case, you'd know about that. And this would be something that would be, you know, whitelisted in some way. But right off the bat, if you have an Excel document calling WMIC.exe, right off the bat, if you create an alert for that, that's one of the early stages of, of this kind of kicking off. You can get an indicator there. Um, but again, there'll be fringe case here and there with an admin that maybe built an Excel spreadsheet with other scripts. It's possible. Another thing here I noticed is that, um, as we know, with any of these, uh, with Revol, any of the malware ransomware samples, uh, they're going to want to um, maintain persistence. So they're going to try and do some registry key modifications and, and whatnot. For this, they're going to they they created a, a a run once key, and that's something that's you know pretty common for programs that want to boot up every time the, the the system starts. But they use an asterisk, meaning that it is it is also boots up in safe mode. So if you think about it, what other applications do you have users that want to have to open up during safe mode? So right off the bat, if someone you know makes a registry modification for one once key and uses the asterisk, that means it has to be open during safe mode. And that would be another thing I'd alert on because again, what what user, what what normal circumstance in your environment is that is that necessary? Um, if this is like a custom server that has software that has to boot up during safe mode, this is all going to be done during configuration. This is all going to be um, created while you're not in an alerting mode. So while these things are in the wild and people are interacting with servers, this isn't something a user and admin is gonna make changes to. They're not gonna, they're not gonna have it boot up in safe mode unless they're in some sort of change window or configuration menu uh, period where you would know and if you saw the story, you wouldn't be concerned about it, with it. Um, another thing they do, again, uh, changes to scheduled tasks, although you know, changes to scheduled tasks isn't always an indicator, that's a key thing to look at because how many of your common users are making changes to, to scheduled tasks on their own? It's just not that common. So you find that the situations where in the, the you know, certain key value pairs that kind of indicate the scheduled tasks is something that keeps persistence and it's another good indicator. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing is, so prior to executing the ransomware, the threat actors created GPO to disable Windows Defender across your system. If you don't have some sort of alert that, uh, that alerts when your antivirus is turned off, then you know that's, that's kind of table stakes, but that's another key one right there. Aside from you know, GPOs being pushed in general, there should be getting some sort of change window. So if it's being pushed from a non-admin or a new account or something. So those are some of the, you know, aside from the obvious ones that I picked up on from this document. Anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> All right, awesome. So that is actually perfect within the time. So now our stakeholders will be able to comment on this particular report for the next five minutes. And I am going to start the timer and Jorge is raising his hand. So please feel free. Awesome, aw aw awesome uh, review there. Um, Chris, I wanna touch on something you said very briefly at the beginning that uh, some of you might not have caught, and that is that the DFER report is a great resource and uh, goes to the widest audience. And I think we're going to see this as we go through th um, the roulette here. There are going to be some reports that target different audience. Some are targeted to people in the detection world. Some are targeted to red teams. Some are targeted um, to uh, analysts looking up IOCs and things like that, right? So. Um, Plus one on that. We love the deeper report. Uh, sponsor them if you can. I definitely sponsor them out of pocket. They're amazing. Um, and yes, this report, right? Everyone's heard about uh, Revol, right? Um, especially after uh, Kaseya. And uh, I, I like the, the intro, right? You, you can read the first couple paragraphs without being that technical and still get something out of this report. But once you dive deeper into it, we get all the way to the point where we have actual procedures. Um, and one that you touched on right now was adding a registry key that has an asterisk in it. Um, I was actually today days old. So first five minutes of uh, Roulette, you, you taught me something. I did not know that an asterisk in front of a registry key meant that it could start in safe mode. So thank you for that bit of knowledge. And uh, again, shout out to the DFA report. I'll let someone else uh, weigh in. Oh, I just want to say I I was today years old as well when I heard that. So thank you so much for your insights. This is why I love this. 
And uh, I wanted to add too, besides me being a sponsor of the Deeper Report as well, or I pay out of pocket because uh, I think it's awesome, yep. and uh, you know I give them my money. <laughs> so um, is actually the community involvement with the Deeper Report too, like beyond beyond analysts using it. Um, something that I thought was really interesting was Black Matter twenty three. And he he tweeted out um, eight detection ideas and 18 rules, 18 rules. And so he has a whole GitHub with detection ideas, detection rules based solely on the DFA report. And so I just really love to see the positive impact that the DFA report is having within the community and all of these amazing professionals around the world, kind of like the people on this panel, they're people from around the world coming together and discussing cybersecurity and protecting organizations. So thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this? Okay, Danny. Okay. So for me as a incident responders, L3 SOC analyst, some of the things that I like about this is that it tells me what to, it gives me information of what to look for if I'm trying to find the intrusion. So talking about where the files could be located, there are some things that will change, but there are some things that are static based on how the adversary likes to place things. So finding things in say a public folder is out of the ordinary. So those are artifacts that I will look for. And furthermore, some things that I would also try, we usually get a, we usually respond to alerts. And so some of the alerts is generally when a phishing occurs, but finding uh, finding any sort of registry key such as the safe mode is definitely a um, definitely an interesting indicator to look into. So looking into the um, auto runs. So the uh, so the DFA report is definitely a good one for incident responders. Okay, thank you. And Will, any comments? Uh, just a, a quick one is I, I believe that this was one of the first instances of uh, ICE ID being used as the initial access vector for um, R evil, which was a which was an interesting evolution for that particular malware family because it has is associated with other ransomware actors. So it's definitely a malware family you want to prioritize if you're worried about being targeted by ransomware operators. Oh, yes, I, I totally agree with this initial access brokers like that's where the money's at right. <laughs> okay, so I if everyone's okay uh, we're going to move on to the next threat report thumbs up good. All right, so. I'm going to spin the wheel. And secure list so this one goes to who wants it who wants it first is this the black kingdom yes do you want this one danny yeah i'll take this one okay it's all yours and i'm starting the timer right now okay so black um black kingdom that one was one of the more interesting ones uh i can't remember i took notes on this one Kingdom. Let's see. Oh, shoot. Okay, here we go. So this one was actually using Python, um, Python for the entry, of, especially web shells. Since this one deals with web shells, um, this one, the web shells are generally targeting um, forward-facing, public-facing servers. So the as far as the public-facing servers go, these are some ways that we want to take a look at one finding out that there's no no out of the ordinary php files or any sort within our servers and especially the for this one this one targeted the microsoft exchange server which was the, one of the big big events back in a couple months ago once that was out, we did, in fact, thinking of my last people I worked for, we had to 
go around making sure that no one made any authentications and uploads into the Exchange servers. But the way that this was interestingly done, they part coded some when some folders to exclude rather than using regex but for me as an incident responder i would be looking for any sort of anomalous php files or executions within the exchange service that the client owns and that's pretty much about it this one was um this one went more into depth in how it was programmed but from a ttp perspective it's what it would generally upload in and so that for me is where i would be focusing on to make sure the client does not have any anomalous uploads into their servers no that's great that's great and definitely um uh, you know, look at patching those CVEs that are in the report too, right? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, and prioritizing them if they aren't already done. And any stakeholders that are interested in commenting on this particular report? I'll be glad to take that. Okay, thanks, Joe. So um, from, from um, the explanation here, um, you know, again, so as a red teamer, uh, my, my job with uh, the, most of these reports is to either because uh, th this report does uh, is not as uh, in depth as the you know DFIR reports DFIR reports which are again plus one fantastic um, this report is pretty in depth though but they do uh, the, the specific report the CTI channel that you know we're getting it from um, here on the stakeholders panel um, is really telling me you know the, the things that I do as a red teamer with these is I either have to try to write the same ransomware they are the same tactics TTPs they have to help try to break into the network to again help write IOCs um, take it to my detection and engineering team say have you guys seen these things we're about to run these things for you guys to help you see if we can commit to creating better detections and better IOCs uh, for the indicators of compromise so uh, while writing these things uh, this report is thorough enough that um, I could take it and then from a CTI perspective um, you know one of the things that I have to ask though is, is looking at this report um you know am i even a potential affected uh uh you know uh, an affected client am i a target of this report you know i want to spend the time that i have in a, in a nine to five 40 hour work week making sure that i'm writing the right defenses here for my my company for the company here um so when it comes to this report some of that stuff is here uh and but again again some of the ttps are definitely here and i can see that the CVEs they're attacking. So I can, again, try to reverse engineer, find POCs, uh, proof of concepts that'll work, and then develop again a, um, a single executable or a string or an, uh, an individual POC that mimics this specific kind of um, ransomware malware. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, oh, it looks like uh, we have Ricky chiming in. Do you wanna chime in really quick, Ricky? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so looking at the report, listening to uh, what we have folks saying, right? I look at something like this and I'm thinking, this is impacting me or this is affecting anywhere I work or an organization I'm responsible for, business, something like to that effect. And I have to be able to look at these uh, reports and take action, right? So I'm looking at something like this and uh, I have multiple lines of pipelines of work kind of already kind of going out of my mind right now. I'm thinking, okay, we have this scenario. Are we prepared from a insurance perspective? Are we prepared from a PR perspective? Uh, do I know my stakeholders in these areas? Meanwhile, I'm assigning two to three incident response engineers to go into log dives into the network, our endpoints, making sure that we have detections and engaging with the uh, service owners and the service teams to go and get me, you know, data. 
so that I can also make those types of assessments. In the interim, I'm probably also on the phone with our legal team. You know, uh, you know, people who are uh, also um, in charge. You know, like executives, directors, and I'm thinking, I have no shit. <laughs> I have a, you know, a um, potential right for exfiltration within an environment I own, or you know, something that is uh going to impact the business in some way shape or form and so I, of course i don't want to take up it you know too much time but the thought process when i look at something that's uh related to um ransomware or um exfiltration of data or anything like that is i have to think through what the actions on objective are what the impact is going to be and that I am collecting the right people in the room to make sure that we have an appropriate response to handle everything from PR to legal to financial to investigation uh, risks, all in kind of the same room and organizing all of these cats. <laughs> no, that's great. And so Ricky makes a really great point um, that I need to point out, especially for people in the audience that are in larger organizations building those relationships ahead of time so that you know the product owners and you know the people and you understand their their backup schedule let's say your go-to person is on vacation and you don't know who to contact other than that you know and just understanding who to contact building the relationships and forming those connections before something horrible happens um, I know it sounds simple, but it's definitely been very beneficial in my experience to be able to just be like, yo, uh, I need your help with something and already have that rapport established. Um, so if everyone's okay, I'm going to click on another report unless anyone else has something to add. We're good. Thumbs up. All right. And I'm spinning the wheel. Ooh, BC Security 2. Let's see which one that one is. Let's see, that one is the overview of Empire 4.0 C Sharp. And let's see, who wants to take that one? We have, uh, you want that one, Will? Um, could I pass for the next one? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, who wants this one? No takers? I, I can take it. Okay, go for it. All right, so uh, BC Security are the makers of Empire. Empire, or what was originally called PowerShell Empire, uh, is one of the most popular command and control frameworks. I know that because of a project called the C2 Matrix. Um, I also chose Empire as the C2 to teach people red teaming in my Security 564 class. Um, the SANS Red Team Exercise and Adversary Emulation course, because in a classroom environment, you want a tool that is consistent and reliable and does what you tell it to do every time. And with a lot of C2s, that's just not the case, but Empire is one of those. So uh, back in July 2019, the original creators of Empire said that they were ending development and the folks over at BC Security took over development, which is fantastic. Um, in this case, we're going to talk about in this blog post, it's talking about the latest version of Empire, which is 4.0 and C sharp. And uh, right off the bat in the intro, uh, you can see that a lot of the new C2s are popping up and the way to create implants, actual payload or the stager that runs in your environment is before was PowerShell, right? Um, now, lots of people say PowerShell is dead. Sometimes it was Python, but we're definitely seeing an uptick in C Sharp. Um, and C Sharp is a language you can, anyone can actually write C Sharp code. You can download a version of Visual Studio Community and compile your own uh, C Sharp uh, code. So uh, in this case, we take a look at how Empire works, the, the latest updates to it, how to run it. It's a C2 framework. So you have the server component, 
which is your listener, listens on a particular uh, uh, port. We can see that Empire has uh, mostly HTTP listeners. So we, we know the, the C2 will be over uh, HTTP and HTTPS. You set the uh, delay and jitter, which is how often that uh, endpoint's gonna call out. And then you have to create a payload, what they call a stager. Um, so the net new here is the ability of creating this C sharp stager. It's just the code used to compile that payload and get it to execute on uh, a Windows system. Um, as we see this, just like PowerShell, when PowerShell was starting to be used, that infamous uh, Derby con talk or DEF con talk by uh, Dave Kennedy, there was no detections, right? And even today, PowerShell is tough to catch, but essentially what, what we're seeing is the move to C-sharp because of that same thing, right? It's able to execute a lot of antivirus and anti-malware and anti-exploit solutions aren't catching a lot of C-sharp code. So that's really the, the biggest uh, net new here in this case. If you haven't tested or used Empire, by all means, <laughs> check them out. Um, they're free. There's a whole bunch of C2s out there. Um, and understand how these work, right? Um, a lot of these are, are open source. They're used by um, red teamers and adversaries alike. And the ability to understand and be able to see how those stagers execute on the target system, connect to the C2 server and um, look at it is, it is going to be important. Uh, so definitely more of a, a red team uh, CTI report. Uh, not much talk on detection or anything like that. So okay. back over to you. So the reason why I included this one is because PowerShell Empire, or Empire, as Jorge said, it's really popular uh, with the threat actors. And so uh, before the new release of PowerShell Empire, there was a paper called Disrupting the Empire, Identifying PowerShell Empire C2 Activity. And it's a SANS white paper um, that's available on the SANS website under their resources and paper section, just FYI. And so in it, they talk about HTTP request behavior. They talk about uh, anomalous URIs and a bunch of other network-based indicators to be able to detect PowerShell Empire. And so there's even whole GitHubs with like uh, detection rules that are uh, for those specific configurations of Empire. So now that they released a new version, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight this report to bring attention that we need some defenders to come in here and be like, to do another SANS white paper on this new edition of PowerShell Empire and to perform security research and to try to find a way to uh, find those unique tool marks. Um, I believe key dot, uh, 89, let me, let me get his proper Twitter handle. So I don't, uh, misquote here, um, standby, um, key dot 89, uh, he changed his name. So I'll have to look it up later. Anyways, I'll put it in the chat and I'll put it in the GitHub, but he's a big proponent of something called tool marks. So um, trying to detect the custom out of the box, and I'm horribly paraphrasing it, but detecting custom out of the box features of like, you know, Cobalt Strike or PowerShell Empire, or a lot of the other really popular tools that ransomware actors and cyber criminals and all of that use. Um, and they just use it straight out the box and they don't try to reconfigure stuff sometimes. So like, taking that low hanging fruit, essentially building detections around it. Of course, it's easy, whatever, but getting it out of the way so that at least you have that as an alert in the event they decide not to modify any of the settings. So I wanted to bring that to people's attention. Does anyone else want to comment on this particular report? Oh, Danny, yes. And then in the meantime, I'll look up what he changed his name to on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> So with this one, it's definitely looking for network-based indicators at this point. So some of the signatures that we've I've seen before was going to news.php. Now, whether it's that changed or not for this one, I would have to start looking for indicators that is by NetFlow or 
any of the film that's letting me know that there's graphic connections going on to a certain IP or domain. So oh, and, and really quick, I did find the person's name. I just spelled it wrong. I apologize. It is K-E-Y-D-E-T-89, Harlan Carby. He is an author of books and super smart, and he talks about tool marks, and he's a defer professional. Sorry for interrupting. Thank you, Danny. No, no worries. And then from there, I can pivot to the host that is emitting um, that connection and try to find any other indicators from there that may be agnostic of the C2. But for now, with this one, especially with the update, I'm going to have to rely on network indicators that, uh, that indicators of beaconing. OK, anyone else? So I'll quickly say, so the, you know, tool marks, uh, there's, there's a lovely tool out there for Cobalt Strike called JARM, J-A-R-M. Um, if you think you're being targeted by a Cobalt Strike uh, tool server, you can turn around and use JARM to scan the endpoint, and it will literally see if it can find, like, the proper files that you, usually Cobalt Strike use running. So tool marking be a real valid way to detect these things, because, again, Empire, when it boots up, there are certain ports that need to be open when you are executing from a external source. And um, as uh, George, uh, George said that uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of these things, the reason that they that it became popular was because of the PowerShell. And then when people said PowerShell was dead, people were like, not really, but sort of. And then so they were like, but here's this C sharp thing that, you know, you've been worried about PowerShell so long. You've missed this entire construct that's been here all along. Um, and then uh, you know, again, using the C2 matrix, this will tell you that this is one of the most popular ones, and I love Empire myself, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a great, it's a great tool. Um, okay, so are we good to move on to the next threat report? I have just real quick a couple host based indicators I came up with for that one that I'll slip in real quick. So first okay. of all, uh, CSI.exe, FSI.exe, without any command line arguments, that's going to be an indication of uh, interactive session. Uh, any sort of uh, arguments being passed from those two executables, renamed instances for those binaries, network connections from those binaries, um, you know, file creations from those binaries, and um, you know, that's you know, in certain environments where people are heavily using CRF, that's obviously loud. But you again, you just have to go through and see if it's present, and if and then you know, whitelist what your developers or whatever is doing. But other than that, the average user is not going to be using either one of these. So simply the, the presence of those executables without any command line arguments right off the back should be an indicator that someone is not on the host running that. Okay, thank you so much. Are we good? Anyone else? We're good? Oh, okay. I will move on and spin the wheel. Okay, what's gonna land on? D for report number one. Let's see what that one is and who iced ID and cobalt strike versus antivirus. Ooh, let's see. Who wants to speak to that one? Who wants to start on that one? Any takers? Danny? All right, Danny, go for it. Let me get myself mentally prepared for this one. Yeah, you have 15 seconds, so. Yep, thank you. I can jump in on that one afterwards, too. OK. Cool. I was just muted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So based on what I was reading on this report, this one, um, this one is a resurgence of the use of ICE, ICE ID. And some big inter interesting key points is the use of not only the Cobalt Strike, but WMI. And from what I've seen, they were trying to use the, it, start, it starts off with the, with the word uh, spear phishing word doc, which will release an HTA file and it includes a JPEG that is actually a library that's supposed to be executed by run deal, deal 32 or reg serve 32. And then it tries to do it tries to do the host discovery as well as encoded PowerShell payloads. 
for my, the, what I like about this DFA report is the fact that it goes through the various stages of how it operates, its credential accesses, its how it tries to do a host discovery and the actual manipulation of WMIC of the processes. And it also shows that the antivirus that's already installed can detect some of those anomalies. But it's also good to know of what WMICs that should not be coming consecutively in the environment, especially when it's trying to do a view in the domain, um, trust domain admins and trying to find your domain list. And see some um, visible on the lateral movement, some other key takeaways with this one that I do like is for me as a SOC analyst, not only am I looking for any strange WMIC activities, but processes ran by services or certain PowerShell um, activities, especially when IEX is used, which is trying to execute something. No, that's so great. Um, are, you, are you good, Danny? Are you ready, Chris? Christy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and I have a little bit of comment too. Uh, and then, well, it looks like. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Danny mentioned pretty much a lot of stuff I'm going to cover. I'm just going to kind of get a little specific on a couple of them. So, right off the bat, uh, if you see Mimi Cat's bad. So, anytime that pops up, <laughs> you should have some sort of learning for that. Uh, second, JPEG making any sort of uh, process command line arguments. That should be some sort of indicator there. There's no reason why JPEG ever needs to do call for system info, IP config, anything like that. So um, although you don't, it would be hard to necessarily do every single file type that does that. They may not use JPEG. They may kind of pivot. You should probably figure out, you know, what what file type you can include in some sort of list to, to do an issue recon. Next, the ADF continued Intel and scanning piece. So uh, calling the ADF.bat to do, again, more system gathering information. That's not something that any user does. It's not something your sysadmins are going to do. They've got tools to gather information. They've got all sorts of other things that are never going to sit in there and gather it that way. So if ADF.bat is calling any sort of process and command line that's information gathering, that should be some sort of IOC. Uh, last thing, uh, lateral movement, registry value set. We're using encoded PowerShell. Uh, there's never a time where you're going to have any users that need to hop to another device using registry value set and with encoded, encoded PowerShell. Encoded PowerShell, as we know, you're going to use that if there's some sort of escape character in there or something that will make the, the code not run. There's nothing that you would need as a normal host that, or a normal user that can pivot to another host legally in an environment. There's never an argument you'd have to run that would require you to use encoded PowerShell, except for some really rare edge cases, in which case there's probably some sort of change window. No, that's great. Unless you're in some environments where the where the people like to use encoded commands all the time. <laughs> oh, I know people just like doing it for 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 you know lulls. Yeah. But, but like you know, Sentinel One, all these tools now they'll they'll decode it for you. They'll check through it. You can you can still dig into it. But yeah, you're right. People use it when they don't even need to. Yes. And Will, did you want to comment on this one? Did I get uh, yes. that right? Okay. Yeah. So. Um... This another another blog piece on iced ID uh, attacks, and as we know, it's it's associated with ransomware. But it's it's another important piece because um, iced ID. So in this specific one, the iced ID variant is using a loader called what, what the researchers dubbed photo loader. So it uses a JPEG file to to sort of deploy a hidden payload. Um, strategically, like following iced ID and the overall campaign that so it's been it began as a banking trojan and turned into an access broker but more recently in like the last maybe six to nine months it has been pushed by a spam botnet called the shatak botnet linked to a, to a threat actor called ta551 and it's distributed a range of payloads but more recently it's it's iced id has been its primarily primary payload so it's it's another example of what to expect if your, if one of your endpoints is infected with iced ID, but I mean the the main point that an analyst should be bringing home if they decide to write this report up and you know document it as an instant report, they should be 
sort of explaining why Ice ID is an important threat. And it's it's basically taking over from Emotet, the Emotet botnet that got shut down in January by the uh, Europol and, and Ukrainian police and things. It's There's been a vacuum and Ice ID and Quackbot have basically taken over and pushed in parallel campaigns between them. So it's, and then, you know, Cobalt Strike, that's what we normally see with, with a lot of these malware families. So it's the two two sort of staple threats to be aware of, be aware, be aware of, and um, as as the guys have explained, some good detection rules that you should be using to alert on. Okay, great, thanks, Will. And the little comment that I wanted to add, and we'll hop on over to the stakeholders uh, really quick is from a hunt perspective, I saw the discovery and I saw WMIC, IPconfig, system info, net, NL test, net, um, and a bunch of other uh, other related uh, processes that would need to execute within a short amount of time. And so if you're performing a hunt for this type of thing, instead of making it per se specific about command line arguments, uh, grouping the processes, you know, of like all of these, all of these within this particular report that are used, and then you time bound it by like, you know, 24 hours or even an hour or whatever, right, because they move very quick. And so um, I believe if you do that, it'll cut down on false positives within your organization of, you know, the random person just doing uh, IP config, right? Because you don't want to alert on that because that'll that'll create a lot of traffic, a lot of alerts to look through. So aggregating the whole report as a whole and then creating a hunt around that specifically and then investigating any potential anomalous activity of any uh, matching results if you do have any, which uh, I'm hoping you don't. That was my contribution. Anyone else want to say anything? I'll, uh, as a stakeholder, I'll say, uh, you know, again, another uh, from from my CTI panel, if you guys were feeding me this information again, um, as, as a red teamer, I can definitely help you recreate the actual IOCs, actual detections with our tools. The the DFIR report and what you guys have explained is, again, one of the, like, uh, the, the level of detail they go into that then comes to you guys that can then come to me. Uh, and then I can take to the operations team is just phenomenal. But uh, the 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 tooling here, again, being things that are free, simple, easy to use, um, and and but good good news is it's highly detailed, so we can write the right detections and build the right tooling to emulate it. Okay, thank you. And uh, I want to throw a little bit of a mix in and have Karan speak about our mystery threat report that we picked. Um, so Karan's going to have three minutes to speak to this mystery threat report. And then we're going to close on out uh, with Jorge and the rest of us commenting on a size threat Thursday, uh, because A, I love it. And B, I warned you all that I'm a huge fan of Jorge. So <laughs> OK, so Karan has the floor and you have three minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So this uh, report, mystery report is basically for the recent uh, uh, bazaar load or bazaar backdoor uh, campaign, uh, bazaar call. It's the report in, in terms of, you know, how it's reporting is done. It's, it's very good. But I feel that it's not very accessible because some stakeholders, for example, uh, DFIR, they would like quick access to the TTPs. They would like quick access to the IOCs. Uh, the TTPs and IOCs uh, is generally uh, like you need to siphon off by reading. There's a lot of reading involved. So, uh, but the the good thing about it, like th this has good content. This has good screenshots, diagrams uh, explaining the attack chain, screenshots about the email, even the uh, you could say the the unique uh, unique IDs that the attackers used to uh, identify all of the victims. Uh, and uh, another good point about this are there there are hunting rules where, which uh, which can be used with Microsoft 365 Defender. It's pretty good. Uh, the only disadvantage, as I said before, is it heavily relies on uh, actually reading the report, and some stakeholders might not like it. Um, in terms of 
key takeaways. This is particularly very interesting because I think Microsoft has been tracking this for around a month and this is like one of the newer campaigns. So, and due to it resulting into a ransomware, which is, I, I think it's Conti or Ryuk. Uh, it's definitely interesting in that sense because Bazaar Loader is a prolific malware and any updates on their TTPs, their new campaigns is particularly interesting. Uh, in terms of speaking about the, mm, the detection rules, the detection rules, uh, particularly provided by them, are extremely good because it provides tracking for the, uh, you know, hunting for the emails. It even includes uh, hunting for the exfiltration tool of the ransomware, which is, I think, our clone. Yeah. And uh, other than that, there's very particular interesting thing, and I want to uh, like uh, focus on this, is the use of social engineering uh, in in like this whole campaign. Because the highlight of this is they use the attackers, the threat actors use like a, a fraudulent call center to in case uh, the victim decides to call uh, that number which is provided in the email. That can actually uh, lead to like a per person over that at a call center and social engineer the vic victim into, you know, uh, malicious execution link attachment, whatever it can cause more harm. With th that is very interesting in my opinion. And uh, other than that, nothing else for this report. It's a, it's a good report, but I feel like they, they could have included the TDPs and the ICs like a particular table in the last to make it easier for people who are researching it. Okay, and the comment that I would like to add to this is um, Unit 42, Palo Alto's Unit 42 recently came out with a report, 729-2021 on Baza Loader. And so in it, they have like, uh, they have a bit.ly link that has a bunch of IOCs and stuff like that. It may not necessarily be tied to the Baza call campaign. Um, you know, I would need to perform analysis to see the difference between the Microsoft report that was the mystery report. It was called uh, Baza call. Uh, let me go to the top of the report. Baza call, phony call centers lead to exfiltration and ransomware. So I would have to compare the Baza call uh, report to the one that was produced by Palo Alto with the IOCs. But the point is that it both that both of them involve Baza loader. So um, I would look at that and take a look at those IOCs as well as uh, you know that's BAU activity. But the whole point of this is that if you get a report and they don't have the TTPs or IOCs or whatever, um, pivoting on that and looking for other organizations that may have done reporting, such as Palo Alto Unit 42, they do some awesome work too, and uh, supplementing the reports that come out for that. So anyone else want to comment on that before we move over to Jorge? Okay, Will and then Danny. Uh, yeah, so the Baza Loader, Baza, Bazaar Cool campaign is uh, is a really interesting one to me. Um, it's linked to the infamous Ryuk and Conti gang, which I think CrowdStrike tracks as Wizard Spider. Um, this group is very well known for using like a, a range of delivery techniques that purposely are designed to evade detection. Um, I wrote a blog about all the different techniques they use, and Bazaar Cool is the one they're currently running. And the thing that makes it so interesting is there's no malicious links inside the email itself. It's just the phone number that you call and are guided to. And then once you reach the fake website that they've created, you have to enter a code to be able to download like the spreadsheet that they give you. So there's so many different ways to thwart researchers like myself and methods to evade detection. It just makes this gang a really prolific threat and, and one to definitely you know, actively hunt for because there's a chance your tools won't won't pick them up. Thank you so much for stating that. And Danny? Okay, so this one is a very interesting one because this one actually involves more than just going into the network and trying to hunt. This one involves working with your organization to put out a message as far as dealing with um, fake call centers. Just a reminder to the and to the cohort, to the employees, hey, you are you have a call center in the organization. You this is an external email that's out. You're not using that. You're using this particular one. 
And I bring this up because there's been cases where there's been fake um, calls acting as Microsoft trying to help with situation with uh, computer issues by running commands. There was a fake call center. It's a little similar, but not quite. It was involving running scripts, which inevitably effect, infected the host. So this is where you want to leverage your departments to help put out a message. Now, from the forensic side, I see a couple of things of, say, the use of cert util. Depending, uh, especially when cert utils being used to do URL cache to grab things from another location, what do you want to watch out for? Okay, great. And now we will take it over to the final report, uh, just an overarching discussion of Threat Thursday. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity through independent research to speak with some really awesome professionals and they've actually operationalized uh, this Threat Thursday where every Thursday it comes out, they mobilize their team to like perform an actual real purple team exercise related to this particular report that they put out. And we happen to have Jorge with us. So I thought um, it would be nice if he could just speak to it really quick. And another reason why I really, really like this is that they include not only uh, community uh, based information, uh, sourced information, but they also have like a detect and respond section as well, which I feel is exceedingly, exceedingly important. So thank you very much, Jorge. Take us, take us out. Cool. Yeah, yeah. no, just real quick. Um, so th this was something that uh, I started early when I joined Scythe. I've uh, been there for about a year. Um, essentially was to make some of these uh, threat intel reports and reports from incident responses more actionable and bring value to organizations. So we do kind of what we did here, right, which is consume these cyber threat intel reports and make them actionable um, for the purposes of adversary emulation and essentially what we're now calling attack, detect and respond, right? Essentially, everything we talked about today was something post initial access. I think all organizations nowadays are working under that assumed breach of, you know, whether it was an O day, which we've heard a lot of, or, um, you know, some ice tea or trick bar or whatever. What happens next, right? So we take these reports, the defer report is uh, a fun one, uh, right? And actually get those procedures. And that's, I think, something where the CTI world can improve on is actually providing the procedures, the defer report being a great example of that, because then uh, people like myself, like uh, Joe, Blind Hacker, uh, right? We grab those actual procedures and then we can create these emulation plans. And of course we build these emulation plans and share them with everyone. Uh, we share them with our customers uh, in JSON format. They can simply import it. But of course, we want to contribute to the community as well. So we publish them um, as uh, attack navigator heat maps as well. Um, we give the actual procedure. So if you just want to copy and paste them or use something like Atomic Red Team, you can still get value out of it, right? We, we don't force you to, to, to have to use site um, and things like that. But um, here's a, a perfect example of uh, the, the, the one you're sharing is um, uh, Microsoft published how uh, Nobelium was getting around defenses, uh, leveraging this attack chain. And what we read through the attack chain and said, hey, wait, there's a new procedure here. And I looked it up on Atomic Red Team, it wasn't there, said, all right, let's play with this, figured it out, and then, of course, contributed it back. And this particular case um, actually ended up um, PRing it into Atomic Red Team as well. But of course, if you want to do it manually, I showed how you can create an ISO file with malicious payload in it. And uh, then just through Twitter, kind of purple teamed it with uh, Cybermonk and uh, Florian and Black Matter, um, essentially just finding ways to, to do the detections. I believe uh, Ryan also was, uh, Pragman was on there. So, uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. I, it's probably one of the funnest things that I do is get to read some of these reports and build these adversary emulation plans and, and share them with the community. And uh, yeah, they're they're all free. Uh, like I said, you don't have to use Scythe for this. Uh, we're big believers in giving back to the community and 
doing purple teaming. So thank you for, for a little, for that shout out. I, I appreciate it. And like I said, just trying to give back to the community. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists too. Um, I really appreciate you uh, coming to share your insights and wisdom and knowledge. I learned something. I hope the audience learned something as well. And um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of DEF CON. I believe this airs on the last day. So uh, thanks for taking time out to watch Threat Report Roulette. And once again, the bit.ly link is bit.ly slash DC 29 roulette. And that's how you can get it or you can find it on my GitHub. It's on Cheerio and it's called uh, DEF CON 29 BT, BTV Threat Report Roulette. And it provides the list of all the threat reports, the uh, threat report roulette wheel, as well as our favorite resources and more information if you want to contact any of the panelists. So thank you very much and uh, have a great summer.